Howdy, lieutenants and economists. The most volatile, evil, disgusting things on the planet, humans. If you have a video request, you can always go to assholeconsulting.com. Yeah, I am gonna charge you, kids. And that is the importance of not fucking up. You are such an asshole! Good morning, children. It is Monday morning. Let's start with the contribution to GDP. Um, our good friend Arcady sends us another softball <laughs> over the plate. <laughs> like, dude, you always send me the easy ones, don't you? Yes, of course. Hey, our new video request for you. Please provide a quote. Would the world overall be a better place if immigra immigration was completely stopped? Would this encourage people to stay where they are and work harder and make their own home com countries better instead of running away and looking for a better life elsewhere? Would it also encourage the U.S. to build a better education system and generally step it up if we couldn't just rely on all the talent we get from India and China, etc.? Thanks, Arcady. <clears throat> and um, keep in mind now my answer. I had to sit down and think this one through a little bit. Take some notes if you see here, which is on the back of my to-do list because I'm environmentally conscious. Um... We're talking about the world, not an individual country, okay? We're talking about the world. And we're also talking from a somewhat academic uh, approach where we're talking about if we had immigration rules that we used to have, where it's like, are you a doctor? Come the hell in. Oh, you're a single mom of 13 little Honduran brats from 12 different fathers, and you, you, because the white man kept you down? No, <laughs> no, hang on. So that's, it's assuming we have sane immigration rules and laws and approaching it more from an academic standpoint. When we're taking in uh, <clears throat> people for voting and they have no skills and they have no talent except for spreading their legs and spreading disease, <laughs> uh, then that's a different discussion. But let's just approach it from an economic standpoint. And I thought there'd be a lot of if, ands, ors, and buts in this, but the answer is uh, no, we really don't want to have immigration completely stop because what it does is it chokes off or limits the movement and allocation of one of the main factors of production that is labor <clears throat> not only labor but intelligent labor which I will argue nearly all economic production and and certainly nearly all economic innovation and growth comes from because uh, we could talk about land labor and capital we could even say our entrepreneurship is part of that four factors of production. But what is iron ore unless it's pulled out and refined? Well, how is it pulled out and refined? Well, it's pulled out and refined with some really freaking awesome sweet technologies that white dudes came up with. Terribly sorry, that's how it happened. How is how is that iron ore transport? Well, it's, it used to be hauled by yak and mule, but until who was it? Oh, white guys again came up with some amazing the combustion engine which allowed for uh, oh, tankers and ship liners and planes and all that. So we, we can go ahead and, and talk about all that. My larger point is that without the intelligent people, who aren't all white males, by the way, without the intelligent people, without, uh, uh, I'm, hmm, I bet you if you go to Silicon Valley, there's not a lot of white guys, as many as there are Asian guys. You know, without these geniuses, without these high IQ, highly productive, highly creative, the, the Steve Jobs of the world, partly Middle Eastern, by the way, adopted too, I believe, <laughs> uh, that without them, there would not be any economic production. I mean, there'd be economic production on a very linear, boring economic growth scale, but not the exponential, um, upheaving, revolutionizing, life-changing, life-saving technologies, uh, the economic growth would not be there. So if you don't allow these geniuses, wherever they're from, to go and reach their full productive capacity, not that they're all going to be Steve Jobs, but, you know, we're talking the Six Figs Brigade. We're talking people who earn six figs a year and likely produce three times that amount in economic growth and production. You are really going to limit the amount of wealth and production being produced for the world as a whole. And the main reason for allowing, at least the smart and the intelligent people of whatever country they're from, India, China, Africa, doesn't matter, is that you will unlock their ability and their productive capacities. Taking them from a country that is a dictatorship, a kleptocracy, or a monarchy, a feudal system, some form of, uh, uh, I don't want to say dictatorship because it's not necessarily that, but 
some form of non-meritocratic economy where you are, the cream does not rise to the top, usually the connected rise to the top, and you don't allow the best to go and plug themselves into an economy or country where the cream does rise to the top, where the talents are not only appreciated but rewarded through compensation, but then also used, availed of, uh, then you really do sacrifice a lot of potential economic growth. Uh, so let me just go through a couple examples here that we got today of systems that are not meritocratic. Some of them are outright dictatorships. Some of them are kleptocracies or have been kleptocracies. And that, what I want you to do is think about the lost potential of production because you have millions, sometimes billions of people living under an unfair economy, a non-meritocratic economy, non-meritocratic environment. And why you could say, oh yeah, get to the United States. I don't know if you'd want to get to Europe, but if you want to go there, you know, get to a place where they're going to reward you for your hard work and more importantly, your intelligent work. All right, first China, communist country. Some elements of, yes, there's meritocracy, but it's highly corrupt. I'd say it's more corruption that's keeping the people down today than it was communism um, because of the Deng Xiaoping revolution. Uh, where today it's like, do you have the money? Are you willing to bribe? Uh, the, the, there, there you have corruption more than anything else, really holding down uh, the best. Um, you know, you could you could argue, well, Harvard, you, you could see that here in the United States. Don't tell me the best go to Harvard. Do not tell me. Do not tell me the blue bloods or the people in Washington, D.C. and mommy's little girl or daddy's little boy who's getting the positions. I mean, here's another perfect example. You all think Sheryl Sandberg worked hard? No, no, no. She, she was connected. Look up the Clary test on her. Her daddy was connected. She all oh, got a job in government at a very young age. Uh, there's a better woman out there, a harder working woman, who would have done way better for Facebook than Sheryl Sandberg. Okay? So in China, millions of billions of people, uh, you have corruption, I would argue, in the past uh, communism. That how many, how many millions of really talented geniuses are never going to be fully availed of their potential and capacities. Uh, India's caste system. Thankfully, this is kind of getting eroded away, but back in the day, if you were born here, cool, you got all the opportunities, and you actually could quite literally, quite literally get away with murder. If you were born in the lower caste system, it didn't matter if your IQ was 140. Fuck you, too bad. Now, and I know a lot of the engineers and IT type of guys, you don't like the HB1 guys uh, coming in from China and India, but now you look at India's economic growth, your caste system doesn't matter what caste uh, what's the word, um, tranche you were born into, it doesn't have that much of an effect. Now you can go to college. Now you can do work uh, overseas and command an income from the United States. May not be good for you guys, but it's definitely good for uh, East Indians. And I would say it's cheaper programming, although some of you would say lower quality programming. Keeping costs down. The call centers, I know, oh, hello, this is Steve. It's like, the fuck you, Steve? What do we owe? Oh, yes, I am from Sarasota, Florida. It's like, you're not from Sarasota. What's your name? <laughs> I mean, it's good if they got good English, but then you're like, oh, do you connect? Do you connect? What? And there are pros and cons to that. Point is, though, uh, Steve, uh, he's making a lot more money. Uh, maybe he's not a super genius, but uh, there's an example of allowing immigration or emigration from India or allowing international trade to happen where we are enriching other people globally. All right, The call center industry, how many billions did the call center industry bring into India? And how many people's lives did it make better so they're not shitting in the goddamn streets? Soviet Russia, my God, if you wanted to, they, they would, oh, if you could make a nuclear bomb, they'd take you in and then Stalin would kill you. Uh, but we had defectors. Look at all the defectors that wanted to come here. And, and not necessarily science and technology and STEM, but uh, some guy that I thought was pretty cool was Alexander Gudinov, who was starting to die hard, died unfortunately of alcoholism. Uh, the best want to get the hell out because you're not paid. I mean, if you're in any kind of communist, look at North Korea again. How many geniuses you know, are just dying of starvation or working in a slave camp? both in the Soviet archipelago, uh, Gulag archipelago, or modern-day North Korea. Right. How many geniuses did Pol Pot kill? 
You kids don't know him. Don't bother looking that up. Communism is great, and your bug-eyed, buck-tooth, uh, retard called Ocasio-Cortez, she knows better. Uh, Venezuela, there's another example. I mean, uh, that's nice. You got an IQ of 145, and you could turn, you could, you could solve cancer. You, you, you're looking for toilet paper right now, and whether wondering whether or not you should whore out your daughter so you guys could, your family could eat that, uh, that week. Uh, Nazi Germany, uh, Jews, anybody? How many intelligent Jews were slaughtered? What lost potential? And they even criticized Hitler about this. The Nazi uh, war machine relied heavily on slave labor, not just Jews, but heavily on slave labor. And what they're, people were, everyone thinks Hitler was this genius. He was not a genius. He, he was, in some capacity, he wasn't. Up. When it came to logistics, I was a moron. Just wasted so much labor and resources. And what they would do is they get all these slaves and uh, they wouldn't feed them. And the Jews, we gotta kill all the Jews. Gotta, it was like, why don't you feed them and then turn them into slaves? Why don't you make it so that they can work? And every once in a while, they'd have um, Jewish sci scientists or smart Jews, or smart Croats, smart whoever they took over, working on different projects. But don't tell me that that six million people who were just squandered and killed, don't tell me there weren't some geniuses there that couldn't have gone and built other things. Not for the Nazis, but for the world in general. Uh, what did some really smart Jews do? They got the hell out of Dodge and went to the States. And I think, was Oppenheimer a Jew? Hang on, was he Jewish? A lot of Jews ended up, uh, Dr. Oppenheimer. Maybe it wasn't, I don't know. Open hike. You can't tell if it's German or Jewish. It was in early life. Jewish textile import. Okay. I mean, uh, who do you want on your team? <laughs> Here's a perfect example. Of like, I don't think he was from Nazi Germany, but um, uh, many Jews did come over. Many were smart. Many produced many things when they got here. Uh, this will be a little bit more obscure, but perhaps some of our Indonesian listeners might know. President Suharto who I now think is dead. Uh, you want to talk about Indonesia, I think is the fourth most populous country in the world. A lot of people don't know Indonesia. Yeah, some place over in Southwest Pacific. It's, it's one of the larger countries, one of the largest countries population wise in the world. It was one of the booming economic tigers in the 90s. And if you didn't know or were related to the president at the time, well then fuck you. The most corrupt, uh, klepto, uh, kleptocratic, Kleptocracy, meaning theft, the government would just steal for people uh, in the world. There was no fairness. There was no meritocracy going on. Again, you could be the smartest Indonesian dude ever born in Indonesia. If you did not know or related to the family, too bad for you. And heaven help you if you were Chinese. I think Chinese. Uh, <clears throat> what lost economic production was there? And then uh, monarchies, the feudal system. I mean, how many peasants? And, and don't tell me the blue bloods. Don't tell me the royals. Don't tell me you know, the, the, the cycle of here's the hardened general that usurps the king and takes over the corrupt king and then brings back peace and economic production to the kingdom. And then he has the son, the eldest son. The eldest son is a freaking moron. But because he's the eldest son, he takes over and throws the world back into piss and pot. Instead, what if the general had taken this young lieutenant that worked his way up uh, americratically and put that person on the throne as his successor? Uh, but no, we didn't do that. I don't know how many thousands of years it took Western civilization and pretty much every other culture in the world. No, maybe it shouldn't be the eldest son. Maybe it should be the best person. And then finally, here in our very own home, uh, affirmative action. The uh, hard-on corporate America and government has on giving women preferential treatment over men, as well as minorities over whites. Uh, but more so, because now this is made into the into the private sector. Government's always been there uh, with the affirmative action brigade, but corporate America has just this boner uh, to promote women over and at the expense of higher qualified men. Uh, that men, in a certain sense, have emigrated, not their citizenship, but their focus and attention and their labor either to overseas, contracting, uh, and entrepreneurship. Uh, they are going to go to where they are best paid. 
Uh, and <clears throat> even though this is not quite a dictatorship here, uh, the form of non-meritocratic of a non-meritocratic environment has prompted labor to emigrate. Okay, I'm going to go over and live in Thailand and collect all the money I can from whatever clients across the globe are going to pay me. So in that sense, labor has emigrated. And you're allowed to nowadays because it's a free country. Um, oh, there's a second question they had that I had to get to. So if you were not to allow immigration or emigration, the amount of economic production in the globe would just tank. Just tank. And, and like any other forms of capital, money's got to find its highest rate of return. Uh, land has to find its best use. I mean, I, you'll drive around and say, oh, that restaurant got time around here in the Twin Cities. I don't know if it's happening in your place, but all these old little strip malls and restaurants are being torn down. What are they putting in? Brand new luxury millennial housing. Luxury apartments. They always have a title, the, the Elysian, the Kensington, the Farmington, the Sing 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 Tun. Everything's got a ton at the end of it. The Sing 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 Tun. Where do you live? Oh, I live at the Hagen Tun. Oh, we live over at the Gretchen Tun. Ooh, bit more prestige, aren't we? <clears throat> um, that's because land has a better use as housing, has a higher rate of return. Uh, and therefore, higher rate of return, it's all about the profit, man. Yes, profit means standard of living. It means more people are willing to pay for it because there's a higher demand for it. And so, um, Without land and capital and money being allowed to invest where it provides the highest rate of return, so too does labor. And intelligent labor, especially because I argue that without intelligent labor, your land and your capital and your buildings don't really mean much. Because you're not going to make that much money with them. Uh, they're just things at that point in time. You need a, an idea and a goal and intelligence behind that allocation and entrepreneurial ideas that demand more of it, which drives up its value. But who wants to listen to economics? All right. Would it also encourage you to, US to build a better educational system and generally set it up if we couldn't just rely on all the talent we get from India and China? <clears throat> Here we're gonna go through academic world versus the real world. Academically speaking, in a controlled environment, ceteris paribus, yes, if you are not allowed to have immigration of intelligent people to come in and bail out the lazy slop that's become your homegrown generation. Um, yes, it, because all you would have to work with in terms of labor is your homegrown labor, your native population. Um, so in a very academic sense, yes, it would put a little bit of heat. The problem in the real world, <clears throat> you misunderstand completely what the point of the U.S. education system is. And I am not, this is not Alex Jones off the wall conspiracy theory. This is looking at the numbers. This is going through the education system myself. This is just what it is. And I... The education system is not there to train kids to be productive members of society. The education system is first and foremost there today, back in the old days it might have been something different, but today is to create Democrat voters. That's all it is. The second, if not tied for first, point and purpose of the education system is to enrich the teacher class. It's to enrich, and by teacher I mean educators, I mean counselors, I mean not all the other barnacles that have grown on this pier or this coral reef of uh, support, non-educated related staff, your, your special ed, your, um, your diversity assistant reserve counselors, your coaches. Oh, the fact that public schools have athletics departments and that's not outsourced. My God, don't even get me started about that. You couldn't play. No, I did. I did play sports when I was younger. I just didn't play in school because <clears throat> it was more fun. Um, actually, was a pretty good athlete. So there, there, that's, that's to enrich that entire, look at the trillions of dollars we spend uh, and the shitty results we get. And the third <clears throat> slash tied for second, maybe even sometimes first, is so that parents don't have to raise their children. That is, that is, those are the three main reasons the public schools exist. Is so, and, and that, that third one is very important because you always wonder, well, why do they keep voting for more levies and taxes in conservative districts? It's because wifey poo doesn't want to take care of the kids. 
Wifey Pooh wants to drop punk kick that kid off to school so she can go get her masters in English so she could go and raise some other rat bastards kids. She doesn't want to raise her own kids. She wants to raise her other kids. Uh, Hubby Pooh, he, he doesn't want to stay at home and take care of his kids. He, he's, he's an important Mr. MBA man who's got to go and sell financial products. And he they don't want their kids. You, you got to get... Guys, I can, it's the old Capmeister here. Most American parents don't love their kids as much as they love themselves in their career. They might love their kids. You know, like, yeah, I love my dog. Yeah, I love my kid. Well, what if that requires you to sacrifice something? Whoa, hang on now here. I have to give up my master's in public health administration? Uh, excuse me, I am a strong, independent woman? And give me that kid, punt kick. Did it miss the field goal? Who gives a shit? As long as it's out of the house. Yes, the, the public schools is largely a babysitting operation for parents who love themselves more than they love their kids. And they don't want to spend the time to raise their kids. That's it. Period. End of discussion. Education comes a distant fourth, maybe even fifth. I'm sure there's some old, other ulterior motive, but um, yeah. You hey, kids, you in school? Yes, because your parents don't love you as much as they should. That's really what it was. <gasps> But that's true. So, <clears throat> yes, we we could argue that uh, if immigration was not allowed, maybe the U.S. school system would improve. Maybe there'd be, an, there'd be a, a slight pressure from a sector that they weren't expecting. But do not. The U.S. education system, please, please. It's the most vile, evil institution we have. And they're not going, oh, my God, we're not going to get any more immigrants. Do you think... Educators think, wait a minute, we've limited the labor of supply, and especially talented labor. Hmm, from a macroeconomic and international economic perspective, we better increase the quality of our education. Have you seen education majors? All drawn with crayon for their master's thesis because they're freaking morons. All right, that's it. Questions, answers, Can't you got to do a lot of work today. We'll see you guys later. Toodles.